for a long period of time. If you were selected by the Montreal Canadiens in round one at the NHL draft, it was like receiving a death sentence for a crime you didn't even commit. In some cases, you could easily blame the player himself. I mean, some of these guys definitely had a few loose screws up in the head. However, in many cases, these young men were victims of a terrible development team. Even if you had a good head on your shoulders, and even if you were an extremely talented hockey player, somehow, some way, over the past couple of decades, the men in charge of this team would find a way to screw it all up. The following production has been brought to you by 20 Years of Misery. Y2K was set to be a very big draft year for the Montreal Canadiens. What a golden opportunity to address the weaknesses of the team. They didn't just have one first round pick. No, 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 no. They had two. And there was no way Rajon Hua was about to get Rajon fooled. Twice. First up, with pick number 13, the Canadiens came out swinging, selecting Ron Hainsey, who was a big, strong, left shot defenseman who would surely eat up a lot of minutes for many years to come. And after playing over 1100 NHL games, it's safe to say Ron really did eat up a lot of minutes, but just not in Montreal. Because after spending up to five years fighting for a roster spot in the Canadiens organization, poor Hainsey was dangled on waivers like a piece of meat. Until eventually he was picked up by the Columbus Blue Jackets. Hainsey would spend the next few seasons with a full-time roster spot, proving the Canadiens wrong, proving that he was worthy of a full-time position. And guess what? Unlike many of the men in today's video, he actually went on to have a pretty successful career. Now, the same could not be said about the Hebs' second pick at the Y2K draft. The guy who everybody was hyped about. I'm talking about 16th overall pick, Marcel Hossa. Yes, that's the baby brother of Marion Hossa. I'm not sure how many of you can remember, but there was such a good vibe in Hebs land about Marcel Hossa. He was looking to follow in his brother's footsteps. He was ready to chew the shit out of any bubblegum that got in his way. But unfortunately for Habs fans, it was all a sham. Marcel would not live up to the expectations, and after playing just a handful of games in the NHL, he eventually made his way to what I like to call the motherland. Well, 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 well. Two first round picks might have flopped in Y2K, but let me tell you something. There's no way that shit's gonna fly in 2001. Not a chance. Not with a brand new general manager by the name of Andre Severt. Get out of here, Rajon. Beat it. And with pick number seven in 2001, the Canadians selected Mike Commissaire, Kami Soros Rex, who was a huge defenseman. Commissaire spent several seasons in Montreal. He was actually pretty good during that time. He could defend, he could hit, he could agitate and drop the mitts from time to time until one day he dropped his mitts with the wrong bear, a young man by the name of Milan Lucic. The result? Commissaire got crimped. And this was the downfall of his career, whether we like to admit it or not. His tough guy persona was now officially over. He would only go on to be Trey Habs fan, signing a big, greasy old contract with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yet he still found creative ways to contribute. But he would slowly dwindle away towards an early retirement. Gee, what a shame. Which brings us to pick number two, a young man by the name of Alexander Perjogan. He was picked 25th overall by the Canadians right after Commissaric. He was from, <gasps> no way. He scored one of the nicest goals you're gonna see in today's video. And he also pulled off one of the dumbest decisions that you're gonna see in this video. Viciously swinging his stick at Garrett Stafford during an AHL game. Holy smokes, he could have hacked off a caribou's balls with that swing. This incident, of course, would result in a very lengthy suspension. He did come back, but just like Marcel one year prior, he flew off to Russia, never to be seen again. But let's forget about 2001. Guys, relax. Give Andre Savard a chance. He's just getting warmed up. And in 2002, with the 14th overall pick, the Canadians selected Chris Higgins. Yet another first round pick out of America. And Higgins had a lot of potential. He was one of my personal favorites back in the day. He had multiple 20 goal seasons early in his career with the Canadians. But when he appeared to take a step backwards in 2009, 
the Canadians shipped him off to the New York Rangers in exchange for about five gallons of horse piss. But we'll get to that later. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did you just get here, Andre Severin? Well, <laughs> too bad. We didn't mean to hire you anyway, it's time to bring in the heavies. Welcome to 2003. No more Mr. Nice Guy, it's the beginning of the Bob Gainey, Trevor Timmons era. And with the 10th overall selection straight off of the streets of Novo Polo, the Canadians snatched up Andre Kostitsin. This guy was made for Montreal. Not only did he have a strong nose for the net, but he also had a strong nose for some of the extracurricular activities around town. This guy loved Sensi Bears. But the truth is, I was a big fan of Andre Kostitsin. The 2003 draft class was absolutely stacked, and at that time, I felt like the Canadians, they hit a home run with this kid. He had a really good shot. He seemed like he saw the ice really well. And for a kid who was just six feet tall playing against beasts like Milan Lucic, you gotta admit, he was pretty sturdy on those skates. But unfortunately, after teasing Habs fans with a couple of glorious seasons, the Kostitsin era would come to an abrupt end. Andre and his baby bro Sergei, who would later be drafted by the Canadians a couple of years later, packed up their shit and moved back to Russia, which seemed to be a common trend back in the day. Now moving on to 2004 now, with the 18th overall pick, Meet K. What's not to like about him? He was my kind of guy. Chipchura was a big, tough centerman. He was said to be a natural leader during his time in junior, but unfortunately he would never reach his ceiling at the NHL level. Now he did manage to play nearly 500 NHL games throughout his career as a bottom six forward, but only 68 of those games would be with the Montreal Canadiens before he was traded away to the Anaheim Ducks in exchange for a fourth round pick, which is pretty pathetic. But fear not, because even a broken clock gets the job done once in a while. And so can the Canadians. In 2005, ding, ding, ding. With their fifth overall pick, the boys went out and they selected Carey Price, one of the greatest goaltenders of his generation. Now, Pierre Maguire was so upset about the pick, he damn near had a heart attack on national television. But rest be assured, with Carey Price between the pipes, the Canadians finally had their piece to build around. There was no way they could miss it up now, right? Pierre, anyone? Welcome to 2006. And with the goaltending department taken care of, it's time for some critical thinking. Should the Canadians pick that talented local kid, Claude Giroux? Pfft, no, that would be a stupid idea. We need defensemen. We need a man who could clear bodies away from the net and, you know, not be a little Petri mouse about it. And that's exactly why we're picking future Habs legend, <laughs> Dave, David Fisher. Wait, who? Here's an interview of David Fisher at the draft. Here's that, that one clip from practice, and that's all I got, okay? Bigfoot had more highlights. But in 2007, Trevor Timmons, he would redeem himself once again. You see that? His tenure actually started off pretty good. With two picks in the first round now, the Habs selected Ryan McDonough at 12th overall, Max Pacioretty at 22nd, and hey, how can we not talk about P.K. Subban in the second round? as an honorable mention. Max Pacioretty, of course, would go on to have a great career in Montreal, putting up multiple 30 goal seasons, eventually becoming team captain. And Ryan McDonough, well, he also went on to have a great career, which is still going strong to this very day. However, he wouldn't even play a single game for the Montreal Canadiens due to that five gallon bucket full of horse piss we were talking about earlier. Ugh. Oh. God, that, that bucket of piss actually had a name. It was Scott Gomez. And both Ryan McDonough and Chris Higgins were used as trade chips to acquire. Was it worth the price? Absolutely not. Oh, man. Give me a second before I continue. This video is really bringing the demons out of me right now. 2008 was pure ass. I don't even know what else to say. You want to talk about a horrible draft year? Take a look at this. Every player that was drafted didn't even get a sniff of NHL action. Not even, not even a sniff. And believe it or not, in 2009, it was arguably worse. Welcome to the year of Louis. Of Louis LeBlanc. Where to begin? Louis was a young local kid who was picked 18th overall by the Canadians. Just one spot before the Rangers took Chris Kreider. And let's be honest, he was doomed from the start. Yup, this kid was placed on a pedestal from day one. They even chanted his name at the Bell Center during the first game of his career. 
And what happened to him? Well, Hab's management convinced the kid to leave Harvard University. They told him he'd be better off joining the team right now. And they fired him into the oven. He played 50 games, got traded to the Anaheim Ducks for a very underwhelming return, a conditional fifth round pick, and now he's retired. He's not even up for a game of street hockey anymore, and I can't blame him. 2010 was the beginning of a new era once again. Bob Gainey was fired, and he was replaced by Pierre Gaultier. Wow, that's, that's definitely an idea. And the Canadians were getting a little scared at this point in time. Their division rivals, the big, bad Boston Bruins, were building a team that was big, tough, and most importantly, talented. They were just dummy teams with intense physicality, every opportunity they had, and the Canadians, they were getting pretty sick of it. Enter Jared Tenorti, the son of former NHL defenseman Mark Tenorti. Jared was picked 22nd overall by the Canadians, and he was a monster of a defenseman. I'm talking six foot six. 229 pounds of whatever Mark was feeding him at the time. This kid probably ate a full hog for breakfast. Tenorti would go on a very strange development path. It felt like every year the Canadians would toss him into the fire for a handful of games and he was bounced around like a yo-yo before finally he was traded away to the Arizona Coyotes for NHL legend John Scott. Wow. It took years for Jared Tenorti to get on the right track. He battled quite a few injuries, but over the past two seasons, I've been really happy for him. Just like a lot of these guys, Tenorti found a new home somewhere else, and he's been destroying everybody's alphabet every chance he gets. But please, don't ever do that again. With the 17th overall pick in 2011, once again, the Canadians were loading up on defensemen. They decided to take Nathan Beaulieu. Everybody seemed happy about it at the time, even Paul McCartney. What's he doing there? Beaulieu was a St. John Sea Dogs legend. He seemed like the kind of guy that could do a little bit of everything out there. Nathan would earn a full-time roster spot a few years after being drafted, but of course, he would eventually get traded to the Sabres for a third round pick. And by 2012, Pierre Gaultier was already run out of town. This man was basically the, the jazz of Hab's general managers. Enter Mark Bergevin. Yes, of course. What a time to be alive. Not only did Bergevin inherit a decent young core, but he also had the third overall pick at the 2012 draft. And he selected Alex Galchenyuk. <whistles> well, that's an excellent choice. He comes from a spectacular bloodline. Galchenyuk had incredible talent. He forced himself onto the team quickly alongside his young teammate, Brendan Gallagher. And two of these guys would go on to have an impressive start to their careers until one of them got traded. On June 15th, 2018, Alex Galchenyuk was traded to the Arizona Coyotes in exchange for Max Domi. Galchenyuk would go on to become the NHL's quote, lady of the evening spending pretty much at least one season on just about every team in the league hey even the toronto maple leafs seriously thank you until finally it all came to a screeching halt last summer when he was arrested for being a complete idiot to an officer in arizona in 2013 the canadians went big drafting six foot six forward michael mccarran at 25th overall oh my god Look at him towering over everybody else. If you put this guy knee deep in water off the coast of Japan, you could film a Godzilla movie with this kid. McCarron had all the tools to be a successful power forward in today's NHL, but for whatever reason, again, he just couldn't get it together with the Habs. He was later traded to Nashville for a dolphin. And lo and behold, look what happened. He just had a career high last season in points and seems to have finally gotten his shit together for a different organization. If you're still here at this point, I can't believe it. This is getting pretty depressing. Now, Michael McCarron might still be kicking around, but the same couldn't be said about 2014 first round draft pick Nikita Sherbeck, who was selected 26th overall, looked fantastic in the Ontario Hockey League. He looked fantastic in the American Hockey League, but once again, just couldn't seem to make it work in Montreal. Sherbeck scored a grand total of five goals for the Canadians, and look at them. Every single one of them were absolute beauties. In fact, it made me sick making this part of the video. 
You gotta admit, his skill set was undeniably good. From what I heard, Nikita Asl had a great personality, but as I said a couple of weeks ago on Twitter, unfortunately for him, Sherbeck was drafted during a time when the Canadians couldn't develop a ham sandwich. By 2015, Trevor Timmons and the Canadians were already on a bad stretch of first round failures. They selected Noah Juleson with the 26th overall pick. Juleson was touted as a really good defender. However, due to an extreme amount of injuries, he too would not make it work in Montreal. He was eventually claimed off of waivers by the Florida Panthers before being shipped off to the Vancouver Canucks where he still resides today. Best of luck to you, Noah Juleson. Now in 2016, the Canadians finally hit a big one. They had the ninth overall pick and they selected Russian defenseman Mikhail Sergachev. <sighs> oh baby, he was good. Sergachev was a stud for the Windsor Spitfires. He jumped right into the NHL at the end of the season. His career for the Habs was likely to be good. However, when Mark Bergevin and friends realized there was a young local kid by the name of Jonathan Drouin being a bit of a butthole in Tampa. <sighs> you couldn't resist, could you? Mikhail Sergachev was shipped off to the Tampa Bay Lightning in a trade that did not work out in Montreal's favor. Sergachev would go on to win multiple cups for Tampa, even putting up a 64 point season in 2022 2023. And now he's about to start a new journey in Utah. Meanwhile, Johnny Drouin, yeah. With pick number 25 in 2017, meet Ryan Paley, who one year after being drafted shot himself in the foot. He did something stupid in the very last game of 2018-2019. Ryan Paley scored a hat trick in front of an over the top Bell Center crowd against the Toronto Maple Leafs, and it was in the very first game of his NHL career. He would also add a goal in the shootout for the cherry on top. No doubt it was a glorious way to close out a season. However, a lot of fans left the building that night and went home thinking Ryan Paling was going to be the savior. There was just one problem. Ryan Paling was the vanilla ice of today's list. In his very next season, he wouldn't even put up as many points as what he did during that one game against Toronto. It was bad. He eventually got traded out of the organization and guess what? He's actually becoming a pretty effective bottom six forward right now. Congratulations, my friend. You escaped. 2018 was the year of Yasperi Kotkaniemi. KK, as some of us like to call him. Kotkaniemi was picked third overall, just like Alex Galchenyuk. And he was ahead of some pretty popular names, like Quinn Hughes and Brady Kachuk. As an 18 year old kid, he got off to a pretty good start in the NHL, boasting 11 goals and 23 assists in his first season. But you know how it goes around here? It all went downhill for Kotkaniemi. You see, Mark Bergevin made some very dangerous enemies around the NHL after trying to steal away Sebastian Butthole from the Carolina Hurricanes, which led to a whole lot of drama, and the Canadians would lose Yasperi Kotkaniemi to the Hurricanes in the process. All they've really got to show for it right now is Christian Dvorak, who was acquired using picks from Carolina. However, if it makes you feel any better at all, God, Kenny Emmy's not really doing too well. But in 2019, a switch goes off. Finally, they stopped thinking about size. They stopped overthinking. And they decided to take a gifted, goal-scoring, Lord of the Rings character at 15th overall. It's our little bundle of joy, Cole Caulfield. A young man who they even allowed to marinate a little more in the NCAA. And guess what? He's still a member of the team to this day. He just put up a 65 point season and he's locked up long term. You did it, Timmy. You did it. In 2020, the Canadians selected defenseman Caden Gooley at 16th overall, which so far seems like a good idea. One year later, Mark Bergevin and Trevor Timmons would make their final first round pick before being run out of town in Montreal and they picked offensive defenseman Logan Mayhew. It was a beauty, but you gotta admit, since the management change, since the since the Kent Hughes, Jeff Gordon era, things sure seem to be a little different right now. The Canadians development team has finally been modernized. Players actually seem to be developing as they should be. And in the near future, I expect the team to reap the benefits of its first true rebuild. 
So the big question is, who gets to blame for all of this? Of course, it's easy to look back in hindsight, but if we're being completely honest, some of them, yeah, they probably shouldn't have been drafted as high as they were. However, in a lot of cases, I feel like these kids were the victims of a very nasty Habs development team. You can let me know your thoughts down in the comments section because that's going to do it for today's video. This one's going to be pre-released for members and patrons of the channel first. You're going to get early access to this bad boy. And if you're looking for a link to sign up, gain some extra content, and start supporting the channel, I'm going to pin it in the comments section. Don't forget to dropkick that like button before you leave here. And hey, I'll see you next time.